So good morning. Welcome to the first plenary lecture of ICASP 2016. It's my great honor to introduce the first speaker. My name is Tom Luo from University of Minnesota and also from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Uh, so today's first speaker is no stranger to the signal processing society, to many of these, uh, to many of us in the society. He's really a household name. So Professor Stephen Boyd received his bachelor's degree of mathematics from Harvard University in 1980, and his PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley in 1985. He's currently a Samsung professor at Stanford University in electrical engineering. Professor Stephen Boyd is a world's top expert in convex optimization and is a great champion for its applications in various fields, especially in the field of signal processing. His lectures, tutorials, videotapes, and the textbooks, and so on and so forth, receives more than 1.6 million hits per year. Okay? And then for his great contributions to convex optimization and its applications, he's been recognized by many societies, many professional organizations, including recognitions such as Fellow of IEEE, of course, Fellow of SIAM, and most notably, a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. So with great pleasure, I introduce Professor Stephen Boyd to you. And before actually he comes on stage, I should mention, guess what? Professor Stephen Boyd came to Shanghai for the first time in 1983. So he, ever since then, he has, has been a frequent visitor to China and great friends of Chinese universities, researchers, and so on. So welcome, Stephen. Um, I guess, good. This is all set? So th actually, thank you very much, uh, Tom. I want to also thank the um, organizing committee for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk today about convex optimization. Uh, it may not be, what I'm going to talk about is not directly related to signal processing, but it should be, uh, of, should be of interest. Um, I should say this is joint work with a student of mine, Stephen Diamond, um, who is actually here uh, somewhere in the, in the mob. So maybe you'll see him at one of the poster sessions or something like that. If you do, you can uh, say hello to him. And of course, you know what it means when I say it's joint work. So I, I don't have to spell it out, do I? No. Okay, good. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about convex optimization with abstract uh, linear operators, and we'll see what that means. But the basic idea is to extend uh, the realm of where you can use generic methods in convex optimization. Uh, so that's going to be the goal here. So the outline is, I'll first, I'll first do a, a whirlwind quick tour of uh, what is convex optimization, why should you care. Uh, don't worry, it'll be very short. Um, I'll then move over to, we'll look at some quick examples. Uh, these will be very simple examples, again, just to kind of illustrate uh, what the ideas are. Um, and in fact, they're going to be, they're even relatively old examples, like as in, you know, 10 years or 20 years. Um, then I'll move on to the main topic, which is matrix-free methods. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, it won't be too technical, but you'll get all of the ideas of what uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, and then I'll just wrap up at, at the end. So first, convex optimization. So this is, uh, yeah, I don't have my pointer, so I'm, uh, I'm, you'll have to just uh, follow me, I guess. Um, so it's an optimization problem. Uh, you have a variable x, uh, which is the thing to be decided, right? Um, you have equality constraints that have to be linear. So that's, uh, that's a requirement. It's a restriction. And then you have inequality constraints, and you have an objective, and each of those functions has to be uh, convex. And that simply means that they curve up, right? So they have non-negative curvature. So that's the idea. And a, a, an extreme case of that on the boundary would be zero curvature. That's when F0 and Fi are affine functions, in which case this is just a linear program here. So this is a convex optimization problem. Now, what has emerged as basically a standard form for solvers uh, is something called the cone, uh, cone program form. And in a cone program form, you minimize a linear function, and all of the nonlinearity in the objective and the constraints is put into a single constraint which says that the variable is in a cone. 
Uh, that's the idea. And then you have linear equality constraints. Um, and the idea is this is supposed to be, it's supposed to make it look like linear programming, standard linear programming. Uh, so if, for example, your cone uh, is the non-negative orthant, this is a linear program. But if you replace that cone with other cones, for example, the Lorentz cone, you get what's called the second order cone program. You can replace it with the cone of positive semi-definite matrices, and then you get a semi-definite program. Right? So these are, uh, these are different cone programs. Um, this, is, this has emerged as basically the standard intermediate form for convex optimization. Um, and actually, that means, I mean, that's like a standard, uh, that's like a standard form in, uh, in you know, like uh, a three-byte code or something like that. It turns out most people don't need to know about this. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. A few people need to know about it, but most don't. Uh, and that's for a reason I'll explain uh, very shortly. So why should you be interested in this? I'll, I'll go over this uh, quickly. Well, first of all, it's just beautiful. The mathematics is just beautiful, and it's nearly complete. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's very nice. The mathematics is very nice. Now, the mathematics has been around for 100 years and maybe mature for 50 or 60. Um, I mean, there's still active work, uh, but it's, it's quite mature. Um, maybe more important, I guess, in engineering areas uh, is that there are effective methods for solving convex problems. Uh, and that's both in theory and practice. And when you say solve, in this case, it really means solve. It really means you get the actually best solution there is. Um, uh, the other thing is if they're, they're polynomial complexity, uh, if, you, if you care about those things. Um, one very nice thing about it is it allows you to, to, um, to actually unify a lot of different methods, right? So if you look at a first course on machine learning, you might, you know, in the first five weeks, you might cover things like regression, ridge regression, lasso, uh, logistic regression, support vector machine. All of these things might look, they might look quite different, but in fact, it's very nice to be able to sit back and say, those are all just convex problems. Um, by the way, for those problems, it, that has no implications. It doesn't mean you should use generic methods to solve them. You should probably use specialized methods. But it's actually just nice to have conceptual unification. Of course, the unification is more than just across, uh, you know, for machine learning. It's for a lot more than just that. The main reason I think it's interesting is that there's just tons of applications, right? And this is, uh, and this is many more than were previously thought. If you went back 25 years or 30 years ago, people would say, oh, yes, of course, there are some convex problems, sure. But most things are not, right? And that's actually not quite right. Uh, it may still be true that most are not. But in fact, many, many problems uh, actually are, many more than you would imagine. So the application areas is a long list. Um, uh, it comes up uh, quite a bit in machine learning and statistics, in finance, it permeates throughout it. Uh, areas like supply chain, revenue management, uh, modern advertising, control. There's many, many problems that are convex in control. Um, signal and image processing and vision, there's, there are plenty. Um, areas like networking, circuit design, uh, mechanical structure design, uh, and, and many of these have go, go back several decades, right? Some of these are from two years ago, and some are from, a, you know, uh, just a couple of, uh, uh, maybe, you know, 10 years ago, this type of thing. So. so let me say a little bit about how you solve problems, and I should say what my interest is. My interest is going to be in generic solvers, and I'll explain why shortly, right? So we're interested in just generic solvers. Um, for medium scale solvers, these are problems with maybe thousands or ten thousands of variables and constraints. So you have, uh, you know, with enough sparsity, it could, be, it could be even be bigger than that. For example, if it's just a one dimensional signal processing, there's essentially no limit. So then it could be a million variables or something like that, right? But these are medium scale, and these are just, these are just solved by interior point methods on, on a single machine. I mean, these are just not hard to solve uh, now. Now, maybe you don't solve them in real time. That's another, that's another topic entirely that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but in fact, as far as just solving them, it's just not a problem. Um, and these, these, base, these are based on uh, problem sparsity. And here, uh, this is solving problems in this standard cone form, this intermediate form. The, the main point about these methods, and this is actually what the real advantage is, and this was actually taught to me by people in very applied areas, right? I would say, they'd say, what's the advantage? I would say, oh, you get the global optimum and polynomial time complexity, and then they would say, no, no, no. You, you have no idea what you're talking about. That's not the advantage. The advantage is that the algorithms work always, 
with no initial condition and no tweaking and no babysitting, right? So this is, that's actually the key. They just work, it's like least squares. It just works. Of course, that's actually a lie. It works about 99.99% of the time and so on, but that's still. We like to say they just work, it just works. It's a technology. Or in some cases, I should say, to be fully honest, it's becoming a technology, and hopefully will be one soon. And this is used, I mean, these, these, this is, so this is used, and if you're in a field where you have a modest number of variables, like finance, you're all done, done. You don't need to know much more, right? You simply use these, and everything's fine. Now, large-scale solvers, this would be maybe with, you know, generically problems with 100,000 variables, maybe up to a billion or more. Um, and these are used, these are basically solved using uh, custom methods. In fact, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So these are solved using custom methods. And you can, you know, go to NIPS or something like that and find out what the most po currently most fashionable algorithms are for solving very large-scale problems. Um, and these are usually specific problems. So you'd look at a specific, you'd look at methods for a specific, you know, image denoising problem or something like that. And uh, this is fine. Uh, many of these would use fast transforms, right, when possible, right? So they would, they would actually use, if you're doing convolution, you're doing medical imaging, if you're doing MRI, of course, you'd be using, uh, you'd be using things like FFTs to actually speed these algorithms up. Uh, now these, these, method, these, these methods, they're, they're generally successful. Uh, I mean, in machine learning, people solve billion variable convex problems all the time, right? So using stochastic gradient or some, or some sophisticated variation on it. Um, people solve, in, for image processing, people solve extremely large problems with millions of variables very quickly. Um, that's exploiting the specific structure. Uh, not only that, it actually requires a lot of tuning for the algorithms, right? Now, of course, once they're tuned, everything's fine. But these are not generic methods, right? The methods for, lo for small and medium scale methods are completely generic, right? I can type in, you know, a problem, could be from finance, control, and it'll get solved. Period. No tweaking, no tuning, no messing around. So one other thing that's happened maybe in the last five years, uh, but in fact, like everything, it has a long history that stretches, in this case, back to the 70s at the least, is the idea of a modeling language. Um, and so in a modeling language, what it is is you simply take optimization up to the next level, right? So what it means is you, in a very high-level language, uh, you would specify a problem to be solved, and then you'd cause it to be solved. Um, and the idea is a system in back of it would take your high-level problem, which ideally should be close to what, what the mathematics is. This should look just like the problem. You write in a high-level language, and that's compiled into a cone program, which is this standard form, and then solved by a standard, a ge completely generic solver, right? It's not a, you don't have a separate solver for image processing, signal processing, finance, control. It's just the same old solver, and it just works, right? So this is the idea. Um, and in fact, once you get used to using these kinds of things, uh, again, working at the low level of, you know, where you're dealing with gradients and things like that, it kind of starts looking like writing assembly language, right? So, it, it's, somebody's got to do it, but basically the vast majority of people do not, do not and should not do that. So, so the idea is something like this. You'll, you'll start uh, over here on the upper left, uh, you'll start with a high-level problem specification. You'll canonicalize, that means to compile that specification into a cone program. That cone program is then solved, and then you'll unpack the solution of that cone program to get the solution of your original problem. So this is the idea. And maybe, maybe people have seen this, uh, I think probably many people have seen this in things like CVX. Um, Yalmip uh, was, one, was probably the first object-oriented uh, version of something like this. There's CVX, and there's uh, two relatively newer ones, uh, CVX Pi in Python and convex.jl. So um, these are actually uh, quite, quite interesting and actually, they actually kind of, they, they work quite well now. Um, so CVX, this was developed by Michael Grant. Um, and the idea is, maybe many people have seen this, uh, but maybe, maybe not everybody. Uh, and the idea is, uh, this is developed in, in top of MATLAB, so you would simply write a problem like this. You'd, you'd declare a variable, and in the, first, in the second line there, uh, x is a variable. Uh, that means it's an optimization variable. It's not yet a vector. Uh, it will become a vector, a numerical vector, once you solve the problem. And so you, you write it down here, and it's very, it's, it's very close to the mathematics. And, when it executes at the end of CVX end, what will happen is 
the cone program will then be solved, and x will be assigned the numerical value, right? So what's nice about this is, uh, is, is that this has, this has actually had a huge, I mean, it, it's, it's relatively simple. It's, it's not complicated. Uh, it's, it's essentially an undergraduate computer science exercise. Um, of course, undergraduate CS majors generally don't know convex analysis, but if they did, it would be an undergraduate CS uh, project. CVX Pi um, is a new one uh, that's actually developed by Stephen Diamond. Um, and the idea, this is in Python. Uh, and so this is actually important because, well, there are a lot of people who will laugh if you say you write stuff in MATLAB. Um, so I'm maybe kind of on their side. Um, but there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, there's, a, there's a very wide group of people who actually, I mean, the nice part about doing something in Python or for example, is it's a real language, right? It's actually a language that, that was designed by computer scientists, actually used as a huge ecosystem and stuff like that, and it's a, it's a real thing. Um, it's object-oriented. It looks a bit different. Um, the interesting part is things like that the variables live as objects outside of the problem specification, right? So uh, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, this should be pretty clear here what's happening. Uh, you declare a cost, which is an expression, um, you, the, the capital problem there is a constructor for making a problem, and you pass it to construct a problem, in this case a problem called prob. You pass it the objective, and you pass a list of constraints. In this case, the list has only one entry. Uh, now that problem, it's not solved. It's simply a problem just sitting there. It's an optimization problem, and then when you call the solve method on it, it's solved, right? And you can pass parameters there to, you know, specify which solver or anything like that. Uh, to use. So this is the idea. This is a CVX Pi. So these modeling languages, um, what, it, what it does is it, it really enables rapid prototyping uh, for small and medium problems, right? So for, small, for a problem with 10,000 variables, you know, if you're at a hedge fund and you want to try some new thing, or if you want to do one-dimensional signal processing, you want to try something out, I mean, this, this is a great way to do it. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, you know, the coding time is extremely fast, right? Uh, this is the idea. Um, of course, it's slower than custom methods, right? Uh, by a factor of 10, maybe 100 sometimes. And if there's some, something that you can exploit in a custom method, like a Fourier transform, then of course it can be like, you know, 10 to the 6 times slower, right? And this is, that, that could be a, that, that could easily be the case. Um, but the nice thing about having most people use modeling languages to, to do optimization and not writing essentially the assembly language of optimization, that's when you drop down and start messing with like gradients and step lengths and all this kind of stuff, which if you're in a, a large, if you work with large scale problems, you have no choice but to do this. But the nice part is actually there's a beautiful inch focus, a change of focus. What happens is you start thinking not about the details of how you're going to solve the problem, but you start thinking about what, what the really important thing is. And the really important thing is not how you're going to solve the problem, but what problem do you want to solve? And this is actually, so this is actually the right focus. Instead of sitting around and saying, oh, are you using LBFGS? Or, oh, you should use ADMM or blah, this kind of stuff. Instead of that, which is all just kind of noise, the real question is, what should you be solving, right? And this is, so I think that's actually, that, that alone is an advantage. Um, for teaching, it's, it, it actually revolutionizes everything because I teach a class uh, on this, and I taught it before and after the advent of these languages. And before, you know, it was mostly a math class. I mean, clearly it was going to be useful, but it was kind of a pain to make it useful. I mean, it might be a couple of weeks or something to actually code something up. So afterwards, I mean, when we have these languages now, I mean, we feel free, we, I mean, when you take that course, you will do signal processing, finance, genetics. You'll do all sorts of stuff, whether you like it or not. And you'll just write little tiny scripts. So it's a, it's a huge difference. Um, so this talk, now I can tell you what it is. This talk is basically, how do you make the, how do you extend what we have right now, which is an infrastructure for rapidly prototyping convex problems. And it works for you know, small and medium scales. How do we extend this to large scale problems? How do we do medical imaging doing this? How do you do image processing doing this, right? These are the ideas. You cannot, use, you cannot use these methods to do image processing. You cannot do, you know, MRI reconstruction using these tools now. And so what I'm going to describe is a little bit of progress towards that goal. That's, that's the idea of the talk. Okay. 
So I'm, I'll stop, I'll take a break, and what we're going to do is look at just a couple of examples. Um, by the way, these examples are quite old, but they're just sort of fun and just to see what they look like. Okay, so the first one is uh, image in painting. Uh, so this is uh, from, uh, oh, this is at least, well, there you go, it's 15 years old. Oh, it's coming up, oh, 20, more than 20, okay? So this is, these are old ideas, but the idea is you have an image and... Um, you have corrupted, you have pixels whose values you don't know, and then your job is to actually figure out what those missing pixels are. And you know, roughly speaking, you wanna look in your neighborhood and match those things, that sort of stuff, right? So it's an old problem. And one thing that emerged maybe in the 90s um, was that a very good way to do this is to uh, minimize simply a total variation. So that's a sum of norms of an approximation of a gradient. Uh, it's a norm. Uh, not a sum of norms squared, so that would be La the Laplacian. And this is a sum of norms, right? That's the total variation. And uh, what's amazing is how simple this is. Um, and what's really amazing is the results you get with something that's simple. Nowadays, you could do way better than this. You could weight it. You could actually look at uh, a billion images and actually get a much better prior, because this is essentially, there's an implied prior here. Here's the CVX Pi code for this, right? And uh, I mean, the details don't matter. Uh, actually, what matters is that it is, it is unbelievably readable and that it, is, it looks exactly like the mathematics, right? So it basically, there's, there's nothing weird and curious. I mean, there's not, it's completely transparent, totally clear what it is. Uh, so that's the problem specification. And uh, so then you, you call the solve method and, and, and you get your problem, right? So we'll look at a quick example. It's, it's, uh, it's Lena. The, the famous or infamous Lena. Um, and on the right, we've just removed a whole bunch of uh, pixels. Uh, that's where the text is. And I guess you have something, you know, uh, rounded, you have about a million variables here, right? So that's still within striking distance of these, uh, the, of this medium scale, right? Um, and this is what happens when you simply execute this code on this image, you get this. Right? And I know that if you do image processing, I mean, this is old news. Um, if you don't do image processing, you should at least take a moment to think, to think like how, to appreciate how like awesome this is. Um, by the way, you can do way better nowadays, right? But this is just, what's shocking about this is this was, this wasn't done with a deep neural network using, that required us to, uh, to uh, run 100,000 cores for a month. And, and to suck in 100 billion images, okay? This was done by just one stupid thing in five lines of Python, okay? So I think from that point of view, you have to admit, this is pretty amazing. And again, I, I wanna emphasize, this is, this, is, this is old stuff. I mean, certainly in the 90s, Rudin would not have, uh, would, would not have imagined that you could actually do something like this, this, this easily or this quickly, but this is the idea. It's pretty amazing for, for how simple it is. It's really simple. Um, if you're curious, like, what happens if you remove, like, just 80% of the pixels, and you get something like that, right? So, again, these are, now you can see the reconstruction is not perfect. I mean, how could, it couldn't possibly be if, you, you know, you're upsampling by 5 to 1 or whatever, something like that. So, but the idea is, again, the, the point here is, if you've seen these, this is very old news. If you haven't seen this, it's pretty impressive what something, re I mean, if, if, put it this way, if this is what something simple does, if this is what you can do with like five lines of Python, imagine what you could do with 50, right? Uh, so it's, it's pretty good. Okay, the le next one will look like it's similar, it's, uh, it's colorization. So you're given black and white pixels and the idea is now you wanna colorize it. And you're given some of the color pixels and again, the code would look like this and the idea is it looks very simple. Uh, it's, it's absolutely and completely transparent. Uh, there's nothing complicated about it. Um, so this, this would be the idea, uh, and you would get things that look like this, right? So that would be the colorization, and it's by no means perfect. You could do way better, way easily, uh, just if you had access to some images, which of course you do, you could, you could get a better prior, I could tweak a few things. So if we expanded that to like eight or ten lines, you could actually do a bit better, right, than, than, than this. But still, it's actually, again, the point here is how, how well it does for something so simple, right? I mean, this is sort of like regression. Maybe, you know, it's the regression for the 21st century, something like that, right? Regression is pretty amazing if you, I mean, you, for us now it's all, for everybody here, least squares is like very simple and we forget about it, but it's actually amazing what it can do, right? And this is sort of like the regression of the 21st century. It's, it's, it's simple, not as simple as regression, but 
for how simple it is, it's pretty effective. Okay, and I think I'll, I'll show one more last example. This one, I guess, is signal processing, or I guess the others were too, image processing. So, um, and it's non-negative deconvolution. Again, this has a very long history, uh, but the idea is you just want to, you want to minimize the two norm of, uh, of the residual, uh, and you want, and then you, the signal x that you're trying to get is known to be bigger than or equal to zero, right? So this is the idea, and I think the the code is exceedingly transparent and straightforward, right? So it just looks, it's exactly what the math is. And here's an, a quick example. So here's your sparse signal, that's the blue, and then uh, it's convolved, and then there's some noise added, and that's the green, right? And I don't think anyone, I mean, you could look at the green thing and guess that there's maybe, I don't know, there's two, clearly at least two signals in there. Uh, you could look a little bit more carefully and see that, you know, something, argue something about the curvature and argue that there's a couple more. But the basic problem is to go from the green to the blue, right? And this, so this is, the, this is, this is, the, uh, this is the, the goal here, right? You know, it looks like it would not be too easy to do, right? If you, uh, this is what happens when you do it, right? So, um, so the, the red is the reconstruction uh, simply by solving that very simple, it's just a quadratic program, right? Well, in this case, it's a second order cone fragment. You solve the second order cone program and you get these red things there and it's, it's amazing. Of course, this is what compressed sensing is. So, I mean, if you've gotten, by the way, if you do compressed sensing or anything like that, after a while you get, I guess you get used to it. And you think, well, sure. But it's actually probably good, like once a week, to go back and realize how ridiculously amazing this is, <laughs> right? I mean, it just doesn't, this is quite, quite good. Uh, and it's actually good to take a moment every week. This is, especially if you do compress sensing, to think of how, how amazing this is, how solving some simple convex problem will actually do things that look amazing. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is come to this question of, now, now you know what it is, and the goal is, how do we make things like CVX Pi, for example? How do we make it so that when I teach the class, I can do full image processing, I can do medical imaging, and the students won't be waiting an hour, right? That's, that's not cool, right? So the question is, how can we do this, right? And the answer is through, or part of the answer is gonna be through matrix-free methods. Um, and the idea here, uh, again, this is an old idea, like. I, many of these things, it's a very old idea. The idea is you take a linear function, and the idea is you do not form, store, or use the matrix A, right? So if you want, you can think of A as being a million by million matrix, which we have no intention of storing, uh, or anything like that, right? And then you can use something like, uh, well, you can afford adjoint oracle. Uh, another name for this would be a scientific programming interface, right? Because if you do scientific programming, typically the only interface to the operators, which might be discretized PDE operators or something like that, would be you can evaluate the forward operator and you can evaluate the adjoint, right? So that would be the typical interface, right? And so we're gonna look at that. Um, so this is the idea. And what we wanna do uh, is, is, is use this, is actually integrate this into the full chain of convex optimization. That's from the language all the way down to the solvers. Okay, well, there's some obvious examples. I mean, things like uh, convolution and DFT, you have N log N uh, transforms, uh, things like Gauss, Wavelet, all sorts of other stuff. You have order N transforms. Other ones would be things like Lyapunov and Sylvester mappings. These come up in control. These are when your variable is actually a matrix and you're multiplying the matrix on the left and the right. These are, uh, these are Lyapunov or Sylvester operators, right? Um, or, or if you like, you can represent them using Kronecker products if that's more familiar to you, right? These are, these are examples of fast operators. Um, sparse matrix, and another one would be the inverse of a triangular sparse matrix, right? So I can store a million by million sparse matrix. Uh, I can, if it's, if it's triangular and sparse, I can compute the inverse. Uh, I can evaluate the inverse and the inverse adjoint very quickly. It's, well, actually in, in actually order n, if n, in that case, not n, but it's the number of non-zeros in the matrix, right? So these are examples. By the way, the inverse of a sparse, you know, sparse triangular matrix is generally quite dense, right? And so that, you couldn't even store it if it was million by million, right? So the point is there's examples of these things. The idea then is to actually go with compos compositions, right? So you represent a linear function, not as a single matrix, but as a computation graph. 
Uh, again, these are ideas that go back and you know have appeared periodically. Uh, there's a whole process. There's a whole processing uh, toolbox. I think it's called Spot uh, that does this kind of stuff. So these are kind of you know ideas that have been around. And the idea is you have a graph. Uh, the inputs are the x. The outputs are going to be the y. And uh, the graph is the computation. Um, and what you can do is, uh, what's nice about this is actually this will play very nicely with scheduling it on multiple processors, right? Because if you have multiple processors, you can actually do things like have a ready queue and have the next processor that comes up uh, take the next, evaluate the next thing. And so you can, there's all sorts of nice things you can do. Okay. So here's a, a quick example would be something like this, right? So uh, here's your, so here B, C, and D are themselves abstract operators. And here you have a graph. Uh, that represents the matrix uh, shown above. That would be the, that's the, the forward graph. And then the adjoint is, again, this is a very old idea uh, from circuits and from signal processing, very old idea. The adjoint is actually the same graph, everything turned around, and all the operators uh, transposed or they're duals, right? So this is the, uh, this would be the adjoint graph. You just evaluate the same graph in reverse order and you take the adjoint operator. Okay, so matrix-free methods. Um, there are uh, a bunch of these. This also goes way back. Um, no, let's see, I'm going to say, well, they certainly go back to the 40s, right? So actually von Neumann talked about iterative methods that only access A and A transpose. But maybe one of the, maybe the most famous is conjugate gradients, right? So that's 1952. And the idea is it's a method to, well, in this case, we'll say that you can, you can, do, you can solve least squares. And the only operations you ever use are you, you, you multiply by A and you multiply by A transpose. And in theory, if you did this, you know, n times or whatever the dimension is, uh, you would actually get the exact answer because it's a quadratic problem. Uh, actually, in practice, that would be false because of, uh, of round-off errors and things. And this is one of, the, this is one of those algorithms that does not uh, work gracefully with uh, round-off errors, right? Um, so this is conjugate gradients. Um, now, it turns out there are matrix-free methods for lots of convex problems, and some of them are, you know, actually, some of them come from signal processing community. Uh, Pock, Chambol, Beck and Taboul, Stan Osher. Um, Gonzio maybe does more stuff in finance and things like that, but these are matrix-free, there are matrix-free methods for solving convex optimization problems. Um, now, the key to these is that you need a good preconditioner and you need tuning. Right, so, so this is actually, these are actually extremely good. If you wanted to solve one problem and you're willing to put in the tuning time and the babysitting time, babysitting means when it runs and it gets stuck, you go back and change some parameters and run it again, right? So you'd say, oh, it's jammed. And then you say, well, restart it and increase, you know, change your line search or I, who knows, whatever it is, right? These kinds of things, right? So for those kinds of problems, this works, this is just fine. It gives you a completely effective method. Right? If you just want to solve one kind of problem, some kind of you know, video uh, denoising or something like that, where you want to do one problem in finance, well, you can tune the parameters and it may be worth it to you. Um, what, these are not yet generic problems. Right? So this is very, very different from, for example, an interior point method for a problem with 20,000 variables, where it just works, period. There's no tuning. There is no babysitting, it just works, right? So that's not there yet. Now, of course, people who do this, you know, doing scientific computing or, or a very specific area in image processing, something, they would say, well, sure, I mean, you're, excuse me, you're solving a problem with 100 million variables. I think you should be happy that we can solve it at frame rate, right? Not, you shouldn't be saying, oh, we should be using a generic method or something like that. And I, I agree, I agree with all that. So, okay. Now, matrix-free cone solvers, this is, this is quite new work. Uh, this is being done by a lot of people. Jacek uh, uh, um, uh, Gonzio is one, uh, has, has developed matrix-free interior point methods. Um, again, Stephen Diamond and, and another of my former students, uh, Brendan O'Donohue, have put together a, a matrix-free uh, solver built on top of an existing solver that's already widely used called SCS. Um, another student, uh, now at, uh, at Baidu, uh, that's Chris Faulkner, does uh, put together a, a GPU implementation for a, for a matrix-free cone solver, um, these types of things. Um, and what I should say is for, for, these for the generic methods that 
I'm, you know, that we're interested in doing here. I mean, remember, the goal is to be able to write five lines of Python and then do medical imaging. That's the goal, right? And uh, by the way, without tuning and tweaking parameters or choosing, looking up in a table or asking somebody or going on a forum and having somebody say, oh, you should use, you know, mirror or something, descent or something like that. I mean, that's not the point. The idea is just to be able to do it. Um, and there, so we have to be looking at just com at completely generic uh, preconditioners. You cannot have a custom preconditioner. Okay, so matrix-free CVX Pi. Um, this is assembled by, by Stephen, Stephen Diamond. Um, and the idea is everything, the entire stack is redone, right? So uh, as you can imagine, something like CVX Pi or CVX, there's matrices floating all through it. Of course there is, right? But the point is, so then you redo everything abstractly. So even when you have a matrix, that's just a special case of a forward adjoint oracle. You redo everything, you redo how everything is done, you canonicalize the problem, that means you map it to a cone program, not, and not one matrix is formed or harmed in, the, in that process, right? So that's the idea, is you create, everything is just matrix-free. You then pass that to a matrix-free solver, like SCS or POGS, this is the idea. So here are the goals. I mean, just to be completely clear about what the goal is. The goal is this. Um, it should work more or less without algorithm tuning. Actually, to be honest, we'd accept much less. It should work 95% of the time. That would be, we'd be totally happy with that. So we have very modest goals. Oh, and the other goal is this. Um, it shouldn't be more than 10x slower than a custom method, right? So let, let me just make it clear what I'm saying here. Normally, a person would say, I want to make a method that's 10x faster than your method. I'm saying, I want to make something that's 10x slower than your method, and I'll be happy if I'm 10x slower and not 100x slower. I'd even accept 100x, right? And the reason is, I want this to be generic. I want, it to be able, I want to assign homework in my class and say, do medical imaging and have the students solve a problem with 100 million variables and have it take 10 seconds. That, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, because that ability to actually solve generic problems without babysitting, without tuning, has actually greatly accelerated research in the fields where that's possible. Like control, if I say, hey, I got an idea about how I want to do something and it's a convex problem, I type it in and, you know, two minutes later, it's running. Now, maybe I'll find out quickly it was a bad idea, but that's progress. So that's the idea. Let's look at that example, the, this non-negative uh, deconvolution example to see what, how this would work, right? Um, now, you can actually solve that problem in CVX or CVX Pi right now, right? Uh, in those languages, when you type conv, uh, when you actually have a convolution operator, what happens is it instantiates and it creates a toplets matrix. I mean, that's what conv is, right? So it creates a, it creates a toplets matrix. Your uh, memory is going to be n squared, and your solve is going to be order n cubed. Right? And so if n goes above 10,000, I mean, that's relatively dense, so you're at 10,000 because it's not sparse. At 10,000, this thing is basically not going to work at all. Right? Um, now, of course, you can solve that problem uh, very easily by lots of different methods. You could use an ADMM method, operator splitting, there's all sorts of things. And in those, you would exploit the, the fact that that's a convolution, and of course, you'd have an n log n uh, method for that. Right? So this is what happens. This is a preliminary implementation of this matrix-free CVX Pi, and it kind of does what we wanted it to do. Um, so uh, the, on the left, you see what happens when you simply use this, the existing methods, and that means that to do convolution, you actually create this toplets matrix. Um, and it's, it, in fact, it empirically scales just like with the theory says, which is, you know, uh, order three, you know, n cubed, it scales just that way. Um, the green and the orange traces show what happens when you canonicalize using completely abstract operators. So there's no matrices anywhere, no ma just abstract operators. So you have these abstract operators, and sure enough, uh, what it turns out is it's kind of just what you want. You can solve problems with, uh, well, let's see, on the right-hand side of the plot, it's uh, it's 10 million variables, and you can do that in a reasonable amount of time, right? So this is the idea. You can solve problems that are, you know, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 times bigger than the other way. So this is, this is not stable enough for me to assign homework problems yet, um, but it will be, and it's actually going to be kind of cool, uh, I, I think. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, 
The second example is going to be a Sylvester uh, linear program, right? So the idea here is your variable is a matrix, and you have a, mat you have a matrix element-wise inequality. So you have A, X, B, less than C. You could represent it, if you like, by a Kronecker product, right? Um, and again, if you, you would effectively be forming the Kronecker product if you were to form this, if you were to solve this using the existing non-matrix-free methods. You'd, for, you'd actually form a, you would actually effectively form a Kronecker product, right? And you get a very similar thing, right? That these things grow. The theory is that it, sh it should grow like order n to the 1.5 in this case, right? So that's because n is actually, you know, p squared, where p is the size of the matrices, right? So, and then p cubed becomes n to the 1.5. So you get something like this. Okay, that's our second example. And I'm just gonna, I'll wrap up. And, well, say is that, so I guess the point is that convex optimization problems, they come up in a lot of applications, right? And small and medium-sized problems can be solved by generic methods right now. Now, by the way, if, you're, if you have a, like a real-time embedded thing and you have to do your calculations in 10 milliseconds, you can't use generic methods, okay? So, but that's fine, that's another, that's another topic. But for many of those, you just use generic methods. Um, so, the idea here is, or the hope and the goal and the progress is, the idea is we want to be able to do this exactly for large-scale problems and fast operators, right? And there's, there's, there's been, I don't know, there's some progress towards this goal. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the main goal here, is to be able to do this for, fat, for large problems with fast operators. So, okay. So there's lot. I mean, I guess there's lots of stuff you could find out about this. Uh, by the way, all all of the code is on GitHub. So you, if you if you're brave enough, you can go and it might it might work. It might not too. By the way, but um, you're uh, you're welcome to to try it. And the idea is hopefully, if you forget about this talk, in two years, uh, hopefully these methods will actually be working reliably, and we'll be able to do cool stuff like I don't know medical imaging and image processing with the, using these charming five-line scripts that we do right now for finance and other things. So, I'm gonna quit here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for another great lecture. Are there any questions for the speaker? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, they're probably like 100x slower. The question was, how would those, those run times we showed compared to a generic method? I'd say there's a hun they're 100 times slower. No, notice I'm not embarrassed. That's the point, right? So, okay, I'd rather say they were 10 times slower, but you know, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, 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 they're 100x slower and I'm, I'm not apologizing. So. Okay, Dan. Uh, yeah. Can you say something about what kind of ecosystem do you have now for this package? Uh, so, the, the actually, all of that is there. I mean, uh, all of it is there. So, uh, could I actually install it and make it run? Hmm, I don't know, but someone competent probably could. Uh, and that's the current state of it. Um, but the idea is that's, that's sort of, for, that's the bleeding edge stuff, and hopefully this will be propagated into the main branch of these things, which are used by a lot of people. So the cool thing would be, you know, and, and unless you really are looking to get your hands dirty, you just wait two years, you do, you know, you upgrade uh, your CVX Pi, and this will be in it and you won't even know it. So that, that's the hope. Well, so um, you have five lines of Python, but in, in order to code a matrix-free operator, it may take 5,000 lines. I'm sorry. Could that happen? It may take what? 5,000 lines. Uh, to, yes, but the point is somebody else did that for you. That's the thank point. You. You're, no, thank you. I thank that person. You're exactly right. Oh, by the way, just for the record on that, ECOS, which is the in, primal dual interior point solver used, the, one of the defaults for this, is 750 lines of C. It ha uses no libraries whatsoever, right? And that includes everything, the li all linear algebra and everything. So it's not true that these algorithms have to be 5,000 lines. Neither is SCS, by well, the way. Well, definitely, yeah. But, but the whole point is that, is that somebody else did it, and then the vast majority of people don't have to worry about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ray, last question. <laughs> okay, uh, hello, uh, Steve. 
this is a beautiful and arrogant. And, and, but I have one question. Yes. For people in industry, they will tell you that Python is a very beautiful fine line, but it takes a long time. Can we make it to C or C++ and also three or four line or five line, and so it can be fast? So that's a good question. So the, I would say that the main goal here is to be able, like, like it is for uh, CVXPy at the lower level now, is actually to do rapid prototyping. So the key about this is you, somebody could very rapidly find out what you, want, what you want to do. And so in one day, you can try 50 different things for your you know, image denoising or whatever it is you want to do. Then that's very useful, right? Once you know what you want, yeah, then there's the question. And the answer right now is no, we don't have any way to do that. But the fantasy would be once you have your problem, instead of after calling the solve method and you like it, you would call the, you'd say myprob.codegen. And out would come, you know, production grade C++, it would be fast, or CUDA or something, right? So, by the way, that doesn't exist. Just don't, that, that's the fantasy. But yes, that's OK, that's the in fantasy. the interest of time, I, we have to stop okay. here. But before we leave, um, we would like to present a small souvenir for a great talk and great uh, effort. Yeah. So Stephen, here's a oh. little crystal oh. display of Shanghai. Of Shanghai. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Steve, for an excellent plenary.